Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. There shall be no segment on WNST this year that will be more Baltimore Positive and more a blast from the past than this one. This has high promise because this guy was one of the first guests on my show back in 1992, and I dragged him up to uh, 10 East or 10, 10 Light Street, five Light Street, I should say, uh, above the McDonald's as the one-time PR director of the Baltimore Orioles and the goodbye celebration of Memorial Stadium with Field of Dreams, which everyone still talks about 29 years later. And uh, then the opening of Camden Yards and Rick Sutcliffe, uh, which uh, I, I saw that piece that the Orioles shared the other day. Rick Vaughn has been my friend for 30 years, even his very, very short stint as the PR director of the Washington National Football League team, that shall remain nameless, uh, of which I think he's still a fan of. He is down in Florida living the good life, and when I think about people that made the great escape, Rick Vaughn, uh, you went down, you were a founding member of the uh, Tampa Bay Devil Rays, uh, you've made a life down there, and Joe Madden came through, and World Series and all that stuff, and I see you on LinkedIn doing stuff with Joe Madden, and I said, you know what, I saw Major League the other night, and the wild thing, and it's time to catch up with Rick Vaughn. How are you? How's life in Florida, pal? Hey, you know what? Things are good, but first things first. How's Jen doing? She's beautiful. She's in the other room. She's working on her shoulder right now. You know, shoulder was a problem after she threw out that first pitch and got cancer <laughs> again. But she's been on the yoga mat since the beginning of COVID, since the beginning of March. She's done about 80 sessions. She does that yoga with Adrian from Austin, Texas. Uh, a little plug for, for Adrian there. And I do yoga as well. But, but my wife is in the best shape of her life. She's 48. She's beautiful. She's healthy. She could still throw out a first pitch if you were having fans down there in Tampa, um, but she's beautiful, and no one was more magnanimous. Maybe Charlie Steinberg up in Boston, uh, but uh, you guys were one in one a down in Tampa on our tour. I can't believe it's been five years. The picture showed up on my timeline. It was June the twenty fourth of two thousand and fifteen that my wife threw out the first pitch. Wow, well, I'm glad to hear she's doing great. She's a sweetheart. Uh, please give her my best. And she's um, she's still upset that you moved her off the mound. You do know a couple of days later we were in Detroit. And we do you know this story a couple days after we left you we went to Tiger Stadium? No. Did you ever Oh Rick, so the the thrill of the tour was she got to throw the first pitch out with her mom and her stepdad with us in Tampa because they live in Sarasota. So a couple uh, maybe 8 days later we we're in Detroit. And we spent the day in Detroit at Comerica Park. And whoever was the pitcher that day was throwing a no-hitter into the seventh inning. I had two no-hitters go to the seventh inning on the tour, which is crazy. Wow. Um, and so we left the game after the no-hitter uh, broke up like the eighth inning. And we were driving to the Detroit airport because I had to throw her out to fly home. I was driving to Toronto, and I had forgotten my passport. Crazy story, right? So I I I'm driving her to the airport, and I had to pee. And I said, look, your flight's not for three hours. We can get off of Michigan and Trumbull here and see what used to be a Tiger Stadium or what's there now. And, Rick, when we pulled up to Tiger Stadium, and you know where it is. I mean, you spent many nights at Tiger Stadium as Orioles, uh, but probably the beginning of Tampa as well before the new stadium came along. And when we pulled up, there were people playing baseball on the field. It was caged in, and there was uh, there was – grass and it was a little unkempt but kept up enough and there were old timers on a Sunday afternoon having a barbecue wearing Ty Cobb jerseys <laughs> and wearing like Lefty Grove gloves and throwing the baseball around and my wife and I walked out there and I had to pee and there was nowhere to pee and I'm in sandals and the guys come up and I had my video camera on and they offered my wife and I a chance to play ball with them on the actual field at Tiger Stadium. This wow. is 3.30. My wife had a 6 o'clock flight. <laughs> I have to pee. Still had to pee. <laughs> and they give my wife. My wife says, I'll pitch to you this time. And I'm not going to listen to Vaughn. I'm going to stand on the mound. <laughs> so she went out and stood on the mound. And I stood in the same batter's box that Brooksy stood in. Right? The same batter's yep. box that Mickey Mantle stood in. Uh, babe never stayed. I'm, th I'm right-handed, so it's a right-handed batter. So I'm in there where K-Line was, right? And she threw one pitch, and I hit it down. I said it was a single to left field. She said Aurelio Rodriguez would have thrown me out. That's what she told me. So, um, Vaughner, man, we had the best time on the – baseball brings people together. It's brought us together. Baseball's changed your life, hasn't it? Oh, it's been my life. You know, it's, it's right from playing baseball in college all the way – 
and even now I, I run Joe Madden's foundation. I'm um, really blessed to be able to have that that gig. And that, none of this would have happened. None of this happens without baseball for me. It's it's definitely. I mean, I had the two years with the Redskins, uh, you know, so that that was in there. But but basically, our whole life, you know, when you're in baseball, it's not it's not a job. It's it's not, and it's not just your life. It's your family's life. It's you a know, lifestyle. It's, it's, it literally yeah, is. It's, yeah, it's everybody's life. So, yeah, I've been so blessed to be a part of the game, and uh, it's great to talk to you, man. Those were great times in Baltimore. I, I mean, I still, you know, I think when I was there, I kind of had a sense, even in spring training and at Memorial Stadium and certainly at Camden Yards, that it was like, this is pretty good. You know, I don't know if it's ever going to get any better than this, just Back then, there was still a good sense, and I, I, I don't know what it's like up there now, but there was such a great sense of community around the team. And, you know, the 10 years I was there, 84 to 94, we weren't, we didn't win anything, you know. How did you get the gig? Had- Can I, uh, like, 84, see, I knew, you, I got my first press pass with your name issued on it in 1986. That's when I started at the Baltimore Sun. So my first press pass was 86 until 06. I had 21 press passes before they took it away. This is my 15th year that I'm banned, right? So Jeez. in 86, you you were the, the person I met at the press. You know, it was you. It was the two beautiful ladies that served French fries and crab cakes. Up Helen in the, and Hazel. Yeah, absolutely. Behind home plate in the mezzanine section where I never could afford to sit when I was a kid. Uh, Hazel's, Hazel's the reason I eat but Brussels sprouts now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, how did you get the gig? You were George Mason. You were a ball player, weren't you? Yeah, I uh, I was wor- I worked in the sports information office there. As my, I got like a half scholarship and half work study, and the work study was in the sports information office, and that's how I got going with it. And then I don't know if you remember this, but in the summer of '84, uh, that that was Olymp- you know the Olympic year that we hosted the Olympics, and we had um, they they had four different soccer venues across the country. Uh, the preliminary games leading up to the final uh, eight teams that would go play in L.A. and one of the venues was in Annapolis, and I got to where I got uh, picked to be the press officer there. And so uh, it was about a two-month gig because you had about six weeks leading up to it to prepare, and then we had two weeks worth of matches, and um, and I got to know the Baltimore media uh, really well through that. You know, they were out every day. There was always news every day of preparing. For the Olympic matches, and uh, we actually had France play their preliminary games with us, and they won the gold medal that year. But um, so I got to know the Baltimore media, and then you know somebody had told me, you know, while that was going on, hey, I think they're going to have an opening at the end of the year. The Orioles are, and so I had a couple of people, you know, I'm sure someone like a Vince Bagley, you know, I got to know Vince, and I still actually, believe it or not, talk to Vince. Uh, and you know, um, I kid Don Moeller all the time. When I met him in 1982, he was my guidance counselor. He's now my co-host of Baltimore Positive, and he told me I was going to be the next Chris Thomas. <laughs> uh, 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 well, Vince, you know, I think Vince probably maybe maybe he made a call for me, or or other people did, and I just got lucky. It was in the right place at the right time, and and I was living in Virginia at the time, so the first year and a half. I drove 61 miles each way to work, but it was worth it. You know, I I, um, I was so happy to be a part of Baltimore and uh, and to be a part of that organization at that time, um, and 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 just to be you know to go to work every day at Memorial Stadium and then at Camden Yards. It was really it was really heavenly, you know, for me. I uh, I can't say enough good things about what happened there, and it was still a mom and pop operation when I was there, so. You know, if somebody called, if a fa- if a fan called and had a complaint, or you know something seemingly pretty small or whatever, we dealt with it. You know, we, you know, they got to talk. I-, I would call people back. I would, you know, I was involved in any kind of issues that came up, and it was just the way we did things back then. You didn't, you know, you talked to a live person and you got direct, uh, you know, responses. And you know, Larry Lucchino was running the club then, and. And he had this thing, you know, he told us, especially when we moved into Camden Yards, because it was like this thing about it, it being elite. You know, it was like, oh, we got a really battle elitism. You know, we're going in this new ballpark. It's not Memorial Stadium anymore. It's, it's, it's moving closer to D.C. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's playing to that crowd. So we were really, really, really aware 
that we needed to continue to be that mom and pop operation when it came to dealing with people. And so we were in the, he told us, you're in the yes business. And that doesn't mean you're going to say yes to everything, but you're going to try. And so that's never left me. You know, I've always, if, some, if one person has a complaint, you know, you deal with it and you talk to them. And, you, and that all started with the, the Orioles, you know, the, the way they were. Uh, Phil Itzo, the traveling secretary at the time, who's passed um, away, was such a great uh, person that way. He was patient with everybody. And that, that's the, you know, I learned everything that I know about the business from the, my days there. I'm so grateful that I got to be there when I was there. You know, Marty Conway is a uh, frequent, frequent visitor around here to talk about business and where it's gone, and he's in the corridor. Why, you know, having watched this the last 30 years, you sort of escaped on the Tampa train uh, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, Rick Vaughn is here. He's the executive director of the Respect 90 Foundation. Um, if you are a young old-timer, to quote John Stedman in this uh, piece, you do remember the 1991 send-off uh, of uh, Memorial Stadium uh, is it fair to call you the architect of that? Because I, I want to give you the credit on that. I'm sure it was a uh, an ensemble of many people, but you were credit. Does that stand as the greatest thing you've ever pulled off in your life? Well, I would say I would say that I was the co-architect with Charles Steinberg. You know, he and I spent a lot of uh, time that off season leading into the '91 season. Um, you know, thinking about what we wanted to do, and we really did plan it. I remember January was a big month of planning that, and by the end of the month, we come up with, you know, what we thought was really going to work, and it was not inexpensive. <laughs> it was, you know, it was. Uh, we, we you brought you brought, brought my in, cousin back from Venezuela, right? We brought Literally. in as many guys as that would, you know, basically that made sense, you know, that wanted to come, and uh, and then once the word got around that we were inviting people back, then players were calling us saying, "Hey, can I come too?" You know, so we didn't say no to anyone, and then. You know, doing it the right way. You know, you have to do it the right way. And then going to Larry Lucchino in February and saying, all right, here's our plan. It's not cheap, but here's what we want to do. And Larry blessed it. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's some ownership groups that would have looked at that and said, how much are we going to spend on this? But it was, it was so worth it. And, we, you know, we spent a lot of nights in, like I said, in January when everybody had gone home, you know, just – sitting there planning it out, trying to have the vision of what we wanted to do. January for October. That's called, like, leadership and strategy, right? That, that's, <laughs> that's the way you have an event in October. You don't come up with that one in September. No, no. <laughs> we, had to, we had so many people to reach out to, and then we had to work with the uniform folks. I can't remember who it was. It might have – I don't know if it was New Era back then. I don't know who it was. But anyway, we had to work with them to get make sure we had the, the right uniform for each guy, the one that he wore when he played here, and uh, – and even uh, we got to the point as we got closer. I remember the um, the elementary school across the street there at Memorial Stadium. I used to know the name, and I can't think of it now. But we we brought those kids over one day, uh, like 125, 130 kids uh, over, and they helped us do a dress, you know, a rehearsal, like you know, getting all the players uh, out on the field on the pr- how long it was going to take, what kind of uh, delay needed to be in between each player, and the, just the whole cadence of it. Well, I remember so we, it being really secretive, though, for all this yeah, that we you did, did. Right, We didn't tell. I mean, you couldn't have done it today because the social media would have blown up and everybody would have probably figured it out. Or, but, uh, we, yeah, we, we were uh, – many people were upset with us that we didn't tell them what we were doing, but we just – we knew, you know, after we – thought it all out. We knew we had a winner. I mean, we knew it was going to be uh, kind of cool. I'll never forget, you know, I was in the tunnel back and forth. You know, we had all of our players, former players, lined up in the tunnel all the way out to the concourse, and we were having them go out. And I was back and forth making sure everybody was in the right order, blah, blah, blah. And then um, I, I was in the dugout for a second, and I hadn't really even paid any attention to how the fans were reacting, but I didn't hear anything. And I was like, holy, they don't get it. And I'm, all of a sudden, my heart went to my feet. I'm like, because we didn't announce anybody's name. We didn't, we didn't feel like, we almost felt like it would have been offensive to do that. They know who these players were. They all had their favorites. And so we didn't, we just had them run out in sort of this dream sequence. And so I'm thinking to I'm myself. I'm watching it right now, by the way. <laughs> I'm watching a tape of it. Well, I'm thinking, nobody gets this. And then I, so I poked my head out of the dugout just to look around. And you know what? It was. I still get goosebumps when I say this. Is that everybody was crying? It was amazing. I mean, it was. You know, there's not a lot of cities that you can do that in. You know, there's that you can. 
not even announce who the players were that were going out. And, and like I said, if you knew you know, your favorite player, you knew who it was, you know, and, you, and that was what the special moment was to you. And then the other thing I'll never forget was I was we had our current team. You know, I told them, you know, after the game, stay in your uniform. We're doing something after the game. So I popped in there just to kind of check on everybody, make sure no one was taking their uniform off. And they were in there, and they were kind of joking around, and they really didn't get what was going on. And then at that minute, the camera showed a close-up of Palmer, who was already out on the mound, and he was crying. There was tears in his eyes. And everybody in that clubhouse saw it, and they just stopped what they were doing. They're like, holy smokes, this is pretty big, isn't it? And then they got it, you know. And then that really was, that was probably the best moment for me, was seeing our players, re, you know, hit it all 25 or 35 or however many we had on the roster that time. They all got it. It was like, oh, wow, this is going to be really special. And then when they got out there, they saw how cool it was and, uh, yeah, in answer to your, long, your short answer, yeah, I think that's the best thing I've ever been involved with. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to share it for everybody when I share this piece out on Baltimore Positive. Rick Vaughn here. I just saw t- uh, Tim Nordbrook uh, shake hands with Luis Aparicio at shortstop, and I'm like, wow. You know, I'm seeing Glenn Davis here high five and everybody coming out of the dugout. So yeah. I see you. There you are, Vaughn. I, I, I see you there in the dugout. Um, uh-huh. Rick Vaughn is here. He is in Tampa. He uh, was the longtime, at least it felt that way at that time, uh, PR director for the Baltimore Orioles, went down to Tampa. And, you know, you had a whole second act down there. Right, I mean, opening up the uh, Tropicana and baseball, and, and uh, the first family that owned it, and the, then then the then the smart guys came in and started bringing in <laughs> great players. And I met Joe Madden for the first time, uh, and I met him several days in a row during the World Series in San Francisco, right before he came into your life. And he was he had the, the fun glasses, and he was sitting in the dugout. And it was obvious that all the media, you know, people on the beat out in Anaheim knew him, and. Uh, uh, he was Sosha's guy and all that. And I didn't even really talk to him. I saw him interact with people for three hours before Game 3 of the World Series in the cold, Game 4 and Game 5, and then he became the manager uh, of the Rays after that. I'm like, oh, man, that was the guy in the dugout from the from Anaheim. Man, everybody liked him. He had a good way with people, you know? Mm-hmm. He had a good way with me, and he didn't know who the hell I was. I was just hanging out doing radio in the dugout out in San Francisco during a World Series game in 2002. Um, Joe Madden, um, of all the people that changed your life, I, I would think right up there with Lakino and all those guys, right? Yeah, I think he'd have to be number one, you know, because uh, it's more than baseball with Joe. You know, I mean, there's so many ways... To- I look at Joe and how he has influenced uh, my life and, and so many other people. You know, he's, you know, first of all, he's just got that ability when he meets someone, you know, they walk away and they, they think, you know, they say to themselves, and this happens every time, you know, people will walk away that have never met him before and they're like, I think I just met one of my best friends. You know, he just has that way of um, endearing himself to people, and it's because it's genuine. I mean, you, you, you know, people sniff that out pretty quick, you know, and he is, um, he is authentic. You know, that would be the number one, if I had to use one word to describe Joe. But then he has this ability. I, I remember one time I was with his agent, um, Alan Nero, and I said to Alan, I said, you know, Joe looks at the same stuff we look at, but he doesn't see what we see. He sees something else. And he and then Alan said to me, he goes, no, Rick, he sees like two or three things, you know. And that was perfect. You know, he sees possibilities where other people don't see those uh, kind of things. And, you know, his like I can tell you now his message to the angels during this whole situation, you know, is I want you to be, you know, this is, you're going to be uncomfortable. And I want you to be uncomfortable. That's part of how you're going to grow as a person. If you come into this thing complaining about, oh, you know, we can't do this like we used to, we can't go out on the road, he goes, that's not going to work. You know, it's going to be inconvenient for you for the next couple of months, and I want you to embrace it because you're going to become a better person for it at the end. And so that's kind of how he's approached this, and, and that's how, you know, that's an influence on me. You know, I try to look at things now that go wrong as opportunities, you know, and and um, that's all because of him, you know, he, and he, he, he does stay positive. And I know sometimes it's, you know, he's just trying to, there are times when things are bad, he just won't, he will not acquiesce to the negative, you know, he'll just stay with it, being positive. And when you see somebody like that, I mean, so many, the first couple of years when he was with the Rays, you know, 06, 07, we were bad. 
And, you know, we'd come in there, you know, the radio guys. And you guys knew you were going to be bad. And he had left yeah. a place where things were good. Yeah, right? but yeah. you know what? We, the radio guys would come in every night to do their pregame show, and they'd be dragging, you know, their feet in there. You know, we were 30 games out of first place or whatever. And by the time they left, every single night, they felt pretty good. You know, they'd leave with this bounce in their step. They'd come in, be, be, and they'd be dragging. But Joe would have a way of, you know, and he said it back then. He goes, we're going to make this place the pit. Nobody's going to want to play here. And we were like, okay, if you say so. <laughs> and he did it. We got you know, sharks he, he in the it. outfield for crying out loud, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So, you know, when I had the opportunity, I left the Rays after the 2016 season. Um, had the opportunity to go to work for him. He was just starting the foundation. Uh, I was like, wow, this is, I've always, I've had great jobs for 30 years. This is going to be even a better job. And it has been, it's been, uh, you know, get, getting to work for Joe. Um, just uh, if you will, let me talk a little bit about the foundation. You know, we, we are uh, aimed at, um, working with at risk children and families, and in the, the areas that Joe and Jay, his wife, call home, uh, and that's in, um, you know, he's from Hazleton, Pennsylvania, as you know. Uh, and he shares that. My, my dad was from Scranton and music and, and, you know, all up in that area and Carbondale. And, you know, and so my, my father grew up in that. I, as a child, I spent a lot of time in Scranton. <laughs> okay. Well, that's just down the street from, from yeah. Hazleton. I've been up there enough where I kind of know the geography pretty well now, but um, so we work basically with, and it's a pretty wide berth. You know, it, it, it's different things in different markets, but uh, we fi- primarily try to work with um, other nonprofits and, and try to assist uh, children and in, 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 uh, at-risk families in, in Hazleton, uh, obviously, because that's it's where Joe is from. And then we also concentrate here in Tampa because Joe still lives here. Uh, Chicago is still very much a part of their lives, so we work in, with Chicago. And uh, we've done some work in uh, Mesa, Arizona, because Joe lived there for years, and the Cubs trained there. And then, you know, uh, Southern California, uh, specifically the Long Beach area. Those are the areas that we sort of focus our attention on. And in we each need to get market, him to manage the Orioles so we can bring that here. <laughs> <laughs> well, in each market, it's something. It's a, it's something different, pretty much in in each market. You know, back before uh, when Joe was managing. Uh, the Rays, uh, before we even started the foundation, he, um, it was 20, the winter of 2010, he went home for uh, the holidays, and then he came back, and then in spring training, one of the first days of spring training, he said to me, he started telling me what happened when he went home, and he was like, I went back to my hometown, and I don't even know it. I'm like, what? He goes, there's so much discord there, there's so much distrust, you know, between the Latinos and the Anglos, it's awful. It's, it's, I, I don't feel anywhere, it doesn't feel like my home. What are we going to do about it, you know? And so we ended up, I'll never forget, we got on a conference call with, he's got some very intelligent, he's got a ton of family up there. If you're up there with him, no matter where you are, somebody will drive by and honk, and I'll go, who's that? And he goes, that's my third cousin, you know, that kind of, he's that kind of <laughs> ingrained up there. But we got them on the, we got a bunch of his family and other leaders on the phone, and we said, what are we going to do here? And so we ended up building a, a multicultural center. We started something called the Hazleton Integration Project, HIP, and we built a, a, a multicultural uh, center, rec center up there in downtown it was an old Catholic high school building. We converted it into a rec center, and really it's much more than a rec center. But, and we offer things like language lessons, cooking lessons, you know, computer lessons, and then there's basketball, and there's all kinds of stuff. And we partner with uh, you know, Ripken Senior Foundation. To, they helped us get some of that stuff off the ground, and they've been a, a great partner with us for, for, on a number of projects. Um, and so we've been, we've been battling it ever since. You know, we've been trying to change the culture up there, and... You know, I think slowly we're we're uh, we're getting it. You know, like uh, right now we're funding a food distribution network up there every Friday, where families come through in their cars and we get uh, we have boxes of food, and we've been doing that you know for three months now, and we'll keep we'll keep funding that and as long as we have to. But uh, so that's been our our probably our our uh, centerpiece is has been what we've been doing up in Hazleton, but. In Tampa, we're involved pretty uh, uh, much with homelessness, and every once in a while we'll go off in a different direction. We, we actually partnered with the Ripken Senior Foundation down here three years ago, and we built a, a brand-new field for the Miracle League, you know, kids that play baseball with disabilities. Uh, in Chicago, we focused on inner-city boxing. 
Uh, Joe really be- is a big believer in boxing, which is a big uh, discipline uh, teacher. And so we've been involved with some of the worst parts of inner city Chicago, uh, has some boxing clubs up there, and we've been able to raise some money for them and show some of those kids up there some attention. And um, and in California, uh, we're we're focusing on homelessness too. So um, we, it's been you know it's different things in different markets. And you know, working with Joe has been you know if I go to him with an idea on something, I don't know that he'll ever say no. And usually he'll come up and and make it a better idea. You know, he'll say yeah, let's do that, but then let's also do this. You know, so. You work for somebody like that, it's fun to get up in the morning. And, um, you know, we're going through some hard times right now, like everybody is, you know, from an economic standpoint. But we've still been able to give about $120,000 towards COVID relief from different projects. So um, I'm really I'm really blessed to work with Joe and uh, to have known him now for a good number of years. Well, I'm blessed to know you going on uh, four decades. Rick Vaughn is uh, helping Joe Madden run the Respect 90 Foundation. You can find them at respect90.org, respect90.org. Joe's always been magnanimous. You've always been great. We don't uh, travel in the same circles. I don't come down to spring training anymore where we're going to play baseball in the middle of a plague. One minute on this, Vaughn. Good idea, bad idea. I am I am square. I'm a sports guy. I'm squarely against them doing this because I don't think they can complete it with any integrity. I think the 60-game season, thinking you're going to get a real World Series, thinking teams aren't going to go down, and I would say the same thing for football. I, I think football is even worse. I mean, baseball, you can sort of stay away from each other. I just don't know that they're going to pull this off. I admire the fact that they're trying, but I think the virus is making the rules. That's my opinion. You know, you and I don't always agree on stuff, but I'll tell you what, you just I couldn't have said it any better. I, that's exactly how I feel. I you know, it was one thing during the war when Roosevelt wanted the, you know, the teams to keep playing, to keep our morale up and our spirits up. But that was a war across the water. You know, that was over in Europe. This is here. There's, this is a war that's going on inside our country right now. And it just doesn't feel, it just doesn't feel right. And part of it's because of what they went through to get to this point, you know, with all the negotiations. I mean, it, I hate to say this because I love the game and I don't like to be, the least bit negative, but I mean, it just feels like it's a run to the postseason money spigot, you know. And so let's get tw- let's get nine guys on the field, you know. And I, I do think the integrity. You said it. I think it's going to. I think the integrity of the game is going to suffer some. I hate to say these things. I really do. But well, when Nick Markakis isn't just, playing, in three minutes, when, when guys aren't playing, the game, it has no integrity. When it's sixty games, it, when when you know you're going to have teams with outbreaks, that's just going to devastate. You, you know, it's just it's going to shut down an operation. That's going to happen, and they know that, and they're going to play anyway. Yeah, I think it's too. It's I, again. I I like to try. I love the fact that they're they really are trying. And I'm not sure, you know, yeah, they're, 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 why are they trying? Well, you know, it, like I said, there's a lot of money involved. I don't think they're coming back to heal the nation. But I do think that, um, I do think there's some risk, you know, uh, especially being down here in Florida now with the way things are going. It's not going so great down here. And, you know, a month ago, you didn't know anybody that had the virus. Now I know 10 people that have been affected by the virus. So it's definitely changing down here. But I, 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 I do really agree with you. I mean, I, I just don't think it's the same. You know, it just doesn't, it just feels like they're trying to, to rush this through. And, you know, you're playing in 30 different ballparks. You know, I traveled with major league teams for 30 years. If somebody got a flu, if we were on the road for three, two, you know, two, two or three homes, two, two or three different stops, by the end of the road trip, everybody was sick. You know, I mean, you, you just, you can take as many precautions as you can, but you're still, <laughs> You're still, you know, 25 to 30-year-old guys together. And, I mean, they're going to have to show some great discipline, really great discipline. And they almost have to be 100% perfect to pull this off. And I'm, I don't know. And, 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 you know, with that and then just the backdrop of what's going on here, and, I, look, I pray every single night that this thing's going to subside, and hopefully it will. But it isn't right now. You know, it's not. It just doesn't. You know, we're going through this really rough time now, and and 
this just doesn't really feel right to me. And not just baseball, the other sports I too. You know? I agree. Rick, I love you, man. I appreciate you. Thanks for taking so much time and, uh, and all the work you're doing with Joe. And at some point, we'd love to have Joe on and say hello when things are normal. And, uh, you know, and, and I have great affinity for Northeast Pennsylvania as well. And I, I see all the work that you guys are doing. It's been great to catch up with you. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Stay safe down those crazy people in Florida, Rick. All right? <laughs> great to talk to you, Nestor. You got it. Rick Vaughn joining us here from the Respect 90 Foundation, respect90.org, along with Joe Madden, but the longtime Baltimore Orioles PR director. Back when I had a press pass, imagine that, as well as the longtime PR director of the Tampa Rays. Rick Vaughn, the wild thing. There he is. Nasty at WNST.net finds me. Calm, local, doesn't get any more local than Memorial Stadium memories, and Baltimore positive.